Okay, hello, I can see some people are joining us. We're just gonna wait um, for, we've only just opened for a few more people to join. So um, lovely to see everyone, really warm welcome. Um, we love to know who we've got joining, where they're dialing in from. So do pop into the chat your name, um, where you're from, what you're up to at the moment, whether you're at uni or just kind of starting out um, in PR, we'd love to know. So uh, do please put your details in the chat while we kind of wait for everyone to join. That would be great. Um, and in a minute, we'll get started. Hi, Temi from London, fellow Londoners. That's great. I'm a little bit new to this, but I understand that sometimes we have people from all around the world joining us. So um, it's usually quite a wide ranging audience. So we'll just give it a couple more minutes. This is great. Lots of people joining and wanting to hear from our brilliant panel tonight. No pressure guys. <laughs> Great, okay. Oh, we've got someone from Brighton. Brilliant. Oh, someone from Cardiff, that's a bit further away in Newcastle. Great, really representing the UK here. Lots of you still studying. So this is perfect to give you a bit of insight when you're thinking about what careers you want to get into. Right, we'll just literally give it a couple more minutes and then we will get, we will get going. Oh, so I'm studying publishing at UCL. I went to UCL, great university. Right, but just one more minute. So hello to everybody. If you're just joining, do put your name and where you're from in the chat. So we love to know where everyone's calling in from. And hi, Simba. <laughs> Got a lot of the Creative Access team joining us tonight, which is great. Okay, right. Well, we might make a bit of a start. I'm sure that we've probably got some more people um, joining us, but I'm keen that we don't keep our panelists too long. So we might um, get going. So I'd like to say a warm welcome to everybody. Uh, to our Creative Access Masterclass in PR. Big thank you uh, to our panellists and to everyone who's made time to join tonight. We've got a fantastic panel who I will introduce shortly. Um, just for starters, my name is Bibi Hilton. I'm Creative Access's Director of Communications. I feel very privileged to be chairing this um, masterclass tonight. It's my first one. I only just joined Creative Access a couple of months ago and before that I spent the last 20 years working in PR on the agency side um, and was managing director of Golin which is a, a big comms agency for five years. So going in-house is a very new experience for me so I am hoping to learn a lot from our panel um, and their top tips um, uh, on working in-house. If you are new to Creative Access and you don't know much about us, um, just to say we are a social enterprise and we work to enable people from communities that are underrepresented um, in the creative industry. So in terms of ethnicity or socioeconomic background or disability, we help them progress and access the industries and reach leadership in creative roles. And if you've never been to one of our masterclasses before, these are regular events, so do sign up and they enable um, us to share insight into what it's like working in particular industries, um, providing career advice and great tips from sector experts like this wonderful panel that we have um, tonight. So we're very lucky to have three senior PR professionals joining us this evening. I'd like to extend a very warm Creative Access welcome to the three of you. Thank you very much. Uh, for making time. I know how busy you all are, so we really appreciate it. So we have um, Jabba Mohammed, who is the Associate Director of Healthcare Communications at MHP. And Jabba is also an alumni of Creative Access. I think started out in journalism and then pivoted. So looking forward to hearing more about that tonight. Shireen Witter, who is the Vice President of Communications at NBC Universal International Studios, uh, who's a great friend of Creative Advo Access and a real advocate for our work and Yinka Akindele, who is the Vice President of Communications at Viacom CBS, who like Shireen is also a great friend and supporter of the work that we do. 
So before I hand over to our panellists, who will tell you more about their journeys, just a little bit of housekeeping. If you want to ask a question, and please, we'd love you to all ask questions, put it in the question function, not the chat function. Um, and April and our team will be moderating. And at the end, we'll have time for a couple of questions um, and we'll ask the most popular ones. You can also follow our live tweeting at underscore creative access or on Instagram stories. And there will be a recording of the session available afterwards. So enough of intros, let's go over to our panelists. So um, I gave you guys a very brief introduction, but I'd love um, one by one, if you can do an introduction of yourselves, explain a bit about your role, what it involves and who you work for. Um, and perhaps we'll start with you, Shireen. Yes, well, hello to everyone. So nice to be here and spend some time talking about PR. I feel that as a comms professional in my industry, I don't actually talk about the different facets of PR that often. It's just about TV and film, which is great, but it's nice to kind of go back to the heartland a little bit and talk about comms and PR. So um, as Bibi mentioned, I'm at NBC Universal International Studios, although we just recently rebranded. So we're Universal Inter International Studios now. Um, and I've been there for about four years now. Um, again, my first in-house role, like Bibi, I came from agency side. And I've got quite a vast remit from publicity, internal comms, culture, corporate comms, events, festivals, diversity, equity and inclusion and everything else in between. So um, quite a vast remit, but I'm um, really, really proud to, to be at NBC and just kind of trying to help the next generation of television makers and storytellers get their foot in the door and champion their content. So nice to be here with everyone. I'm looking forward to hearing from my other two panelists as well to see what I can learn from them as well. Always learning in comms, always learning. Always learning. Thank you, Shireen. Gosh, that sounds a vast remit. Um, Yinka, would you like to go next? Yes, hi, I'm Yinka Akindele. I am VP of comms for Viacom CBS in the UK. Um, a bit like Shireen, I have a very uh, broad remit that covers internal corporate um, not publicity um, day to day, but I work a lot on publicity when it comes to uh, kind of issues management, which is a kind of big part of um, comms. Um, and I've been at the company uh, nearly four years or just over four years, actually. Um, and yeah, I'm just uh, like Shireen, I'm, I'm thrilled to be here today and, and just to kind of try and you know, impart a bit of what, I, what I've learned along the way and, and, and hear from the other speakers as well. Thank you. Thank you very much. Jabba, do you want to go next? Yeah, sure. Um, hi, everyone. Um, my name is Javed Mohammed. I am um, a bit different from, I guess, the other two speakers. Um, so my background was originally journalism. So um, that's how I know Creative Access. They helped me get into the world of journalism, succeed in the world of journalism. And then probably about six years ago, I think, I pivoted over into comms, uh, actually moving into uh, public sector comms, so I joined the gov a government press office, I started working in the Department for Transport as a press officer there, and then worked my way up. Um, the, sort, of, sort of did spent some time at Transport, then went to the Cabinet Office, mostly doing some international work actually, so I was out overseas in Jordan, consulting with the, um, the Governor of Jordan on how they can improve their comms, and then I came back to London to do spend some time in, in Parliament uh, with the Office for the Leader, of the Leader of the House of Commons. And then I went to the Department of Health, uh, where I was there for about two and a half years. Um, first as the Chief Press Officer for Brexit at the Department of Health and Social Care. And then uh, when the pandemic began, I sort of was took over, not all of the COVID brief, but you know, a big chunk of it. Um, so mostly doing the public health and medicines remit, which covered everything from vaccinations, uh, therapeutics, PPE, you name it. Um, and, uh, and I was also chief press officer to Chris Whitty, the chief medical officer and his deputies. Um, and then after, and in June of this year, I, I left that role to come and work here in an agency for MHP in their healthcare team. Um, where I largely work on sort of pharmaceutical, pharmaceutical clients, but also charities, uh, patient groups, um, universities, think tanks, that sort of thing as well, but all in the, in the healthcare space. Um, yeah, so it's, I guess, a bit different from everyone else, but I mean, like them, I'm always ready to learn and looking forward to hearing about what they, what their experiences are. Great. Thank you, Jabba. Um, 
Well, let's kind of dig into a little bit more about um, the industry and PR as a career. Um, I think it would be great to understand more around why each of you chose, or if you did choose, or did something happen by accident? And can Jabba talked about pivoting from, from one career into another. So why did you choose PR um, for your career? And how did you get into the industry? And perhaps we could start with you, Yinka. Yeah, I chose PR just because simply I, I, I like writing. I think you've got to have kind of good kind of writing skills if you work in comms, um, a, a, a kind of flair for language um, and telling a story because much of what we do is around kind of corporate storytelling. Um, and I also am I'm very kind of social. So I like to be kind of in a, in a role where you're kind of intersecting and meeting lots of people. So that for me was really a, a kind of a, a big kind of a pull in terms of getting into comms. I initially started out um, doing uh, publicity, so working on kind of program publicity in the TV industry. Um, and I think kind of cutting my teeth on the kind of consumer side of things, it was really fun as well. You know, like, it, you know, you're working with talent and get kind of lots of kind of exposure and different types of, um, you know, brands. Um, so, yeah, so that was really a big part of the lure for me. I've, along the course of my career, I've moved more kind of a bit more towards corporate because you learn a lot about how business functions when you're in, in, in comms. And I, that I find really, really interesting because you get a really kind of good you know, overview of what, you know, how, you know, all aspects of a business. And, and that for me is, is fascinating. So I think there's a real kind of gamut of experience that you can get working in, in comms and PR. And for me, that's a big part of why I just enjoy it so much. I love it. Yeah, me too. It's a variety, isn't it? Um, yeah. Jabba, do you want to go next and maybe you had a slightly different path in with journalism first? Yeah. Uh, why did I pick PR? Uh, well, fair, maybe that's not why, why I picked journalism to begin with. You know, I was always interested in, in writing. I think storytelling is a big part of it. You, you know, by being a journalist means sort of being curious, being creative, uh, being able to sort of communicate a narrative or tell a story in sort of a simple, clear way. Um, but then, you know, after about five years in journalism, I, I mean, this is a bit negative, but I wasn't really getting what I wanted out of that profession, as in, you know, in terms of the training, the development, the, the career progression. Um, and I wanted to sort of maybe pick something with a bit more opportunity. Um, so I had a little think and then sort of thought I'd take the leap and try PR out. Um, and I really liked it, you know, I, I really enjoyed it. Government comms was really interesting. It was a great place to learn. You work on some really high profile announcements with, with, um, with you know, with high profile politicians, obviously ministers um, and the like. Uh, and it gave me lots of, lots of good training, lots of opportunities um, to travel and, you know, just to, I guess, get exposed to a world that I wouldn't normally be exposed to. Um, but, yeah, I think for me, the thing that keeps me in PR is the fact that, you know, you get to meet lots of different people, work on lots of different issues. Um, and yeah, I, I just really enjoy the social side as well. I know I really like going out, you know, like networking, sort of doing that sort of personal engagement. I think PR is like a big part of it. I know it's about relationships. Um, and, uh, and so, you know, that, that sort of sustains me in this, in this, in this industry. Great, thank you. And Shireen, can you tell us a bit about your journey into the industry? Yes, but I've got a slightly different story to the other two as well. I studied third world development and communications at the University of East London, and I always wanted to work for the UN. And I thought I was gonna change the world as a young, naive student. And then I got to my third year and I quickly realized that I didn't actually know what I really wanted to do. And trying to apply for work experience, NGOs and charities, just, just, you know, I wasn't getting the kind of response and feedback that I wanted. So it was when I was doing a PR module and I spoke to one of my course leaders and he recommended an internship part of the Taylor Bennett Foundation. And he said, you know, you can learn about the different facets of PR and communications, maybe try that after you finish graduating and see how you get on. So I applied and I got into the role and it was a real kind of, hybrid internship where I wasn't kind of really working at an agency it was in partnership with a financial and business agency called Brunswick Group and at that the point they'd just kind of gotten over the big BP oil spill so it's all about crisis communication so it was 
a completely different change to what you were learning at university and just seeing it in real life and being able to shadow some of these execs. And then I quickly realized that financial and business and corporate PR wasn't really for me. In all honesty, it felt a bit of a boys club and I just felt that I didn't fit in. And then um, it was, again, over time, I got to meet Josie and I came to a creative access kind of workshop as part of the internship. And I started to realize to what Inca said, there are just so many different disciplines in communications. You can kind of go into corporate or publicity or internal comms. And that's where I really started to learn and just build that interest in communications. And I thought, okay, I like the sound of this, but then the next problem was how do I make money from it? As interns, you know, you're not making money. I was just getting my travel paid for. I was just about managing to cover my lunch and I wasn't living in London. So again, coming back and forth was really difficult. So then I thought to myself, okay, let me try to think about this and think, how do I get my foot in the door, but actually build that experience that's going to set me up for success. Tech PR was one of the most kind of interesting and attractive industries and managed to get into an agency, which was near where I lived in Windsor. And they took a chance on me as an account executive after a three month internship. And I absolutely loved it. I was partly writing about cloud and computer storage, which I had zero passion for. But on the other hand, I was getting to work with Cisco and do their London 2012 Paralympic and Olympic um, sponsorship. So again, it just opened my eyes to just different areas and different routes that you can take. And I just loved the vibrancy of an agency. And I just thought one minute you're writing a press release for this, next minute you're pitching in a feature, next minute you're speaking to a journalist or you're helping plan an event. And that's where I just kind of really started to build that skill set. And then over time, I realized that, again, I didn't have a passion or love for tech because I thought could sustain me throughout this role. And I just didn't feel that it was really fair. And then I kind of moved into London, started at a digital marketing and kind of media agency. And that's where I started to build a portfolio of TV clients. And the MD of the agency realized that obviously I kind of had this passion for TV. So I tried to help harness that with him and say, well, let's bring in more. Let's kind of try and really set up a TV and media division. And before we knew it, we were working with TV production companies and broadcasters, and we were going to Cannes for Mitcom. And I got to meet Naomi Campbell for like a launch. I just thought, it's all glitz and glamour. You know, forget tech PR, this is where it's not. (laughs) And it's not, it absolutely (laughs) is not. When you're on the other side and everyone else feels like it's glitz and glamour, but, um, but when you're working behind the scenes, it's not always the case. But I think that's where I started to kind of build my love and passion for TV. And then again, I, I got to the point of working at a few agencies and I always perceived going in-house as kind of selling your soul a little bit. I thought, are oh, you going to hang up your boots? It's a lot slower paced. You know, sometimes it's a bit kind of political. You've got that kind of corporate entity, but four years in at international studios and I'm not looking back. So, uh, so yeah, made it in a roundabout way into where I am. But um, I guess that's the beauty of PR and what we do. There isn't just a straight path no. to PR and you've got so much to offer, whether you're a, a journalist or you've studied publishing or marketing or comms or, or anything really, or even English, for example. So, so yeah. Thank you all for sharing your stories. Wow, you've all had such interesting journeys to this to this point, really varied. And I think there was just some points maybe to pull out from that. I think one is about the kind of variety of experience and how, you know, kind of for people not to shy away from taking those different opportunities and, you know, pivoting from one area to another, whether that's within different industries that I think can add so much to your to your career journey. I think you also made a really important point about um, internships and the financial challenges around that. We've actually done some work um, around that creative access. And at the end, I will talk about a bursary that we have open um, to kind of help with some of those financial challenges. Um, and I would definitely agree. I think you you all kind of touched on that a bit, that I think there's a perception PR is all about lunch and glitz and glamour, but it's certainly, uh, in my experience, very far from that, often the reality. Um, I think what came clear from all of your journeys is that there are so many different types of roles within PR that it is not just one job. Um, And so it would be great to kind of understand a little bit more about that. I think the two most common routes are either people work in-house, so in in roles like your current roles, Shireen and and Yinka, or in agency or consultancy where what Jabra is doing at the moment. So it might be great for our audience just to understand a little bit more about what's involved with, with both of them. So perhaps... Um, 
Yinka, could you just talk more in detail about kind of what's involved working in house, why you enjoy it and kind of why you're you're focused on that role at the yeah, moment? Yeah, absolutely. So I've worked most of my career in house. I've only worked at an agency for a year in the past. Um, and so I've got a kind of, you know, good kind of solid in house track record. And for me, what I really like about it is that you're able to get under the skin of a brand and really kind of feel, you know, be part of something. And, you know, a lot of people assume that obviously if you're agency side, there is more variety. And obviously that is true. But I think that I've chosen to work for a lot of kind of big US companies. And so there is so much variety that you can get in, in, in these large kind of matrix organizations that are doing lots of things. So I think you do still get that variety. Um, you have lots of stakeholders and having that agency mentality within a large company is really valuable. And that's something that, you know, I kind of learned early on in my career, you have to kind of see all the people that you work with, um, you know, as, as stakeholders and manage them as if you are almost, almost, you know, operating an agency. So I think that that for me um, is, is really um, kind of key. Um, and yeah, I just, I, I think that, yeah, for me, it, it, you know, I enjoy working in house and I enjoy that kind of advocacy that you get. Um, but I think, you know, there's, there's lots of kind of to be gained in agency side as well. So, yeah. Thank you. Um, I agree with that. I think people, that's the perception about in-house. It's far, far from the truth. <laughs> it's very fast paced. You know, yeah. I think that, you know, and I hear what, I, what Shereen was saying, because I've worked also at a tech brand before my current company, I was at, at Yahoo. So media and, and kind of TV is kind of a lot of my kind of background. And, you know, the, the word of the day in a tech company is like iteration. It's all about innovating and constantly kind of moving on to the next thing. And, you know, and really kind of spearheading that kind of change and, and, and dynamism. So you absolutely can get that in in house. I suppose it just depends on what your kind of preference is. Um, you know, if, if you want to kind of, you know, really kind of get under the skin of something, or if you just like to kind of work on in a more kind of project fashion. Um, yeah. Great. No Thank worries. you. And Jabba, you, you work for a big agency, MHP, has a great reputation. Um, can you talk a bit, share with everyone what it's like working in an agency? Yeah, sure. Um, so I've only been in an, I should say, I've only been in an agency for about five, six months. So I'm not, I don't have, I don't even have as much experience in an agency as the other two panelists. Um, but I mean, I can tell you, yeah, it's very fast paced. Um, the advantage of working in an agency is that you get to work on lots of different clients. Um, you know, sort of you're exposed to different things. If you have particular interests, you can sort of try and go and pursue those depending on the agency you're in. Um, you know, like no, no sort of two days are the same. Um, you know, there's plenty of opportunities to sort of, you know, do everything from writing tweet copy to editing scripts. Uh, to working with uh, influencers, to you know, brainstorming uh, sort of the creative for a media campaign or for you know, advertising campaign, whatever it might be, um, and then you know, then you have the advantage of also working at different levels. So you know, you work with UK-based clients, global clients. You work on you know, I, the team that I work with. Sort of sometimes do policy work, they do comms work, advocacy, patient affairs, government affairs, that sort of thing. So it's, there's just so much variety and the scope of what you can do in any given day can, can vary hugely. And, you know, that's one of the big reasons that I moved into an agency. I wanted to come to an agency after working for five years in-house. In um, it's I just really wanted that, that broader experience, you know, because when I worked in house, I was very much a, uh, a media specialist. I worked in press. You know, I, my my sort of place was sort of talking to journalists, selling in stories, writing press releases, pitching all that stuff. But I wanted to sort of do a broader comms piece. So let's say looking at you know how would we sort of develop a strategy for for a all singing all dancing comms campaign that includes press, me, um, social media, stakeholder engagement, all of that sort of stuff. Um, so really for me is thinking about how I broaden that skill set and make myself a more rounded comms individual, uh, which sort of drew me to the, uh, to the agency world. I would say, and I want to echo what's already been said is that, you know, please don't be sort of lulled into the sense that like being in house is in any way slow paced or boring. It's not being in house is ex can be extremely fast paced, extremely challenging. You know, I was, uh, you know, I was in house, the department of health during the pandemic, which was like the craziest, busiest I've ever been. So um, 
yeah, I mean, I would that agency is just a different sort of busy. They're just diff different models. Thank you. Thank you all for sharing that. Um, I'm now going to switch. We've had some questions submitted in, in advance um, from people in the creative access community. So I've got a question from Fiona, which is about what one piece of advice would you give for someone at the beginning of their career in PR? So perhaps I will go or stay with you, Jabba. Go on, give us a piece of advice. Um, so I was thinking about this before I came on the call. <laughs> Actually, a really good piece of advice that someone gave me um, in, at one of these masterclasses, a creative access masterclass, I think it was in 2015. Uh, it was in the House of Lords. Um, well, I can't remember the name of the speaker, but one of the speakers told me that, like, get mentors, find good mentors, people who can, like, guide you, coach you, you know, like, offer you advice, you know, can have frank conversations with you, um, and that's something I really took away and really took to heart. And I've been very, very fortunate that I've found people in my both personal and professional life who have like been very generous uh, with offering me advice and telling me, oh, you should do this and you should do that. And if they haven't known, uh, they've always been willing to, um, uh, to point me in the direction of someone who does know the answer. Um, so yeah, my advice to you, if you're at the start of your career, find good mentors who can who can sort of you know guide you and offer you that advice that, that's so crucial great advice obviously creative access would totally support that piece of advice um shireen do you want to go next to share a piece of advice yes i guess the one piece of advice i would say is let your passions really come through I think it's so tough when you're just starting out and you haven't necessarily got any work experience or you've just got your degree to fall back on. And I think sometimes people always think that that already just puts them, you know, at a disadvantage. But if you are passionate and if and when you get the opportunity to, you know, have an interview or get through to the last stage for, for a job, sometimes it's your passion that can really set you up as a candidate. We've had so many people apply for roles in my team who have been brilliant on paper almost perfect like you know you just think this person could be perfect and then you meet someone and their passion and their drive just just makes them just they, they just come across as just so different to someone who may be more skilled than them or have more experience than and then them and I think for us in communications it's about people and it's about finding the right people to work with us and do the job I think you just cannot underestimate your passion and your drive. And, you know, for us, it's about, you know, will you fit into the team dynamic? Will you fit into the, the NBC dynamic? To Yinka's point, we have so many stakeholders. You know, you have a corporate brand, you have an identity in-house. And sometimes you're just looking for someone who's just got something special in there to just kind of, you know, kind of sometimes even just add to the team. I think you can't, you know, like I said earlier, you never stop learning in comms. And I love that, within our team we've got quite a flat structure and I don't really I'm never one for hierarchy and I just think our intern that we have at the moment I'm learning so much from him and he has a passion in digital content and video editing and again you don't naturally do that within my comms team but just seeing his passion has completely changed the game for us and has enabled us to just boost our offerings for for the studio so make sure your passion comes through. Thank you. That's great advice. And I love that point about you learning from the interns coming into your team as well as teaching them. I think that's that's a really important dynamic. Um, Yinka, what about a piece of advice that you would share? I would say, I mean, I, I wholeheartedly agree with the last point about learning and, and being on that kind of you know lifelong journey when you're working in comms. I mean, I'm, I'm always learning and I think that's, that's really, really kind of um, interesting. In terms of um, advice, I would say a good piece of advice that was given to me um, early on in my career was about, particularly in comms, keeping a calm disposition, because often there is so much that's going on around you. And I remember very early on, like my, one of my bosses saying to me, do you want to work in comms? And I was like, yeah, of course I do. I was you know, like kind of quite stressed, something was going on. I was like, yes, yes, this is what I want to do. And she was like, well, what you need to do then is you just need to kind of just like step back, take a moment and, you know, just realize that, you know, there can be issues that kind of come, there can be kind of issues can spill over into being quite kind of crises. And you've got to keep that kind of calm head. And I was really grateful to get that advice early on in my career because, you know, I've worked, you know, along the way, that's par for course with the job. 
And I think having that ability to kind of just be very methodical in terms of how you approach things and kind of break things down so that you become a kind of a trusted advisor to your business, um, because that's what people are often, you know, as well as the corporate storytelling, they're looking to you for kind of sometimes guidance, advice. And so I would just say like, you know, that for me really stood out as, you know, advice early on in my career. And I was really grateful to hear that. So I would just say, you know, kind of take that, you know, and, and that kind of center, take that moment, you know, there's always a way through, you know, it's PR, not ER, as yeah. that's another kind of, you know. That's and my so favorite all, phrase. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. And so there's always a path through and you've got to help be that kind of navigator. So that's what I would say. Um, yeah in terms of advice yeah that's great advice we always talk about people being swan-like so on the surface it seems like it's all calm and in control and underneath their legs are going like that so, um thank you um another question actually also from from Fiona I think you know you all had and you know uh, set off on incredibly successful careers but I think we all know it's not always easy industry to break into um that is changing um, but it'd be interesting to know if any of you kind of faced a challenge at the start of your career, perhaps getting into the industry and how you went about overcoming that. Jabba, you look like you're nodding. Perhaps do you want to <laughs> take that question? <laughs> yeah. Um, it's fair. I sort of feel like I hugely credit Creative Access with helping me early on in my career. Um, so, you know, I, um, I started in journalism at a local paper, but sometimes being in local papers can be a bit of a dead end job, right? Um, because I was, um, you know, I was 21, 22. I got this job after doing a di postgrad diploma in journalism. Um, and I'd been working with that job for about two years. And then, you know, I was really fortunate that I'd, I'd known Josie because Josie does the um, was doing the PR for a local school in the area that I covered, so we'd spoken a few times, and an opportunity came up um, came up through Creative Access for an internship uh, at the at the Daily Mail, um, and Josie rang me up and said, "Would you like to apply for this? Uh, you know, they want to interview someone," and I said, "Yeah, of course." And you know, and and through that, and Josie offered a lot of help. And you know, like they, you guys, I think there was obviously coaching and some advice on how to answer questions, how to, how, you know, and and all of that. So um, and that sort of really just set me off on on my on my path. Um, but you know, when when you're, you know, like everyone said, when you're young and you're trying to break into the industry, it's not easy. It's not, you know, like it just seemed to be a thousand obstacles, and you never have enough money, and everything's just like, oh God, what have I done? I don't know, I, I had loads of like moments of panic, I feel like, especially when I was starting out. Um, but I was just very fortunate to have met sort of some good people who uh, who helped me along the way. Um, and also, I guess the other thing I'd say is that it's really important to be proactive, you know, um, when whenever when an opportunity comes, really you've got to try and seize it with both hands and try and make the most of it. Um, yes, of course, Josie and Creative Access helped me a lot in sort of giving me the opportunities, but, you know, if, I'm sure Josie would agree, a lot of those opportunities, I had to sort of fight and win for myself. You know, they, they, you, there's a door, but really it's only you that can walk through it. So, um, yeah, so I, I guess that's sort of my view on that. Thank you. Um, Yink or Shireen, I don't know if there was a particular challenge that you faced starting out that you'd like to talk about. Yeah, I mean, it wasn't easy. I knew that I wanted to work in the media industry. And at the time when I was kind of starting in my career, it, it wasn't easy. It was a very um, kind of very, it had a perception of being an industry. that's quite kind of public school, you know, quite kind of privileged. And that's not my background. You know, I went to like, you know, a state school from a modest background. And so I didn't really kind of like fit the mold as it were, you know. And so it was very disheartening at the beginning, you know, kind of, right you know I used to apply for lots of jobs and you know didn't you know it was, it was really quite a struggle and you know my first kind of job in tv I was um, doing publicity for the bill which is a um, police drama on ITV that's no longer on air and I remember kind of I got that job and I remember the strength of it was on the kind of the writing test because you know a lot of jobs kind of in comms do writing tests and I remember them saying that although on paper you weren't the strongest candidate 
um because I didn't think I'd got the job even because it was such a kind of grilling and and then they said yeah your, your writing test was you know really strong and so I think for me that is it's having that kind of self-belief like I knew I could do it I knew that I was good and that I could you know I had it I had it in me but I was quite disheartened by that point and I just thought well maybe maybe it's not for me and, and I think it's just never giving up and I'm just glad that I didn't and I'm just glad that I persevered because you know I'm in an industry that I love and in a, in, you know, in, in a sector that I just find, you know, really, in, you know, in, I get so much enjoyment from it. And so, yeah, it's hard. It is hard, but, but persevere and, and, and have that self-belief because it, that will keep you going and that will give you that drive that you need. That's great advice. Thank you. Um, Shireen, I don't know if there's a challenge you want to share. To be honest, the bigger, biggest one for me was just, finding my way, figuring out what I wanted to do after coming out from university. I think it's just so hard, especially when you're at university, like you're focused to do the best you can. And obviously when I, in my course, there wasn't an option to do a sandwich course or go and do a year out at a company anywhere. So I was literally starting fresh and it was just, it was tough. I think again, similar to, to Yinka's point, you know, believe in yourself, but also really take advantage of the resources and the support that's around you. For some reason, especially at University of East London, the employability team or, you know, just seeking out that information, it wasn't really encouraged or, you know, my group of friends, they just weren't really doing it. So I never knew that the great resources existed there. Um, and again, like finding the Taylor Bennett Foundation internship, which introduced me to creative access. So just, you know, even if you don't know what you want to do, just, just keep going and things, but just persevere, just keep pushing and you'll find your way. You'll definitely find your way. That's also great advice. Thank you. Um, question with a slightly different perspective um, from one of our community, from Shorte, who wants to know if any of you ever suffer from imposter syndrome and if you do, how you cope with it, which I think is a really interesting question for PR people because I think and all of you come across as very confident and very outgoing. So I think it's quite an interesting question um to ask people that work in our industry so I'd be interested to know if that's something that you ever experience um I know Shreem while we're on you is that something you can relate to very much so especially coming in-house and this being my first in-house role I really really suffered from imposter syndrome and as I kind of moved up the ranks and became part of the leadership team I also felt it quite strongly I often perceived myself as this young black woman who wasn't really worthy to have a seat at the table. And I used to kind of literally go into certain meetings and just check myself a little bit and just sit back and maybe kind of filter myself and feel that I can't really contribute. And it got to the point where meetings would come and go and I, I just wouldn't contribute or add any value. And I just think, you know, I'm here for a reason and I can only give what I can give based on merit and my credentials and my experience. And if it's not good or I'm ever felt that, you know, I'm not appreciated, then I can go elsewhere. And luckily that was never the case. I think it was definitely a personal experience and something that I had to overcome myself. Um, and, and it's tough because back then as well, there wasn't the resource, there wasn't the guidance. People weren't really talking about it as much as we are now. And I'm, I'm glad that there are certain stigmas and, and experiences and, and just things that we are more openly willing to talk about now. Whereas before it's like, you know, you, you hold your tongue and you just keep on going. You just turn up and you, you do the best you can. And again, as a young black woman, I've always been taught like you're gonna have to fight harder. You're gonna have to be challenged more than others. So just always put your best foot forward. Um, and it's weird because there was a turning point for me when we went through um, the murder of George Floyd. And at that point, we were all stuck at home with COVID, just really frustrated and angry at the pandemic. And it's almost like we had no one to vent to. And that's why, Jabba, I'm intrigued to hear about your experience with Chris Whitty, because I, yeah. I love to know such an incredible man, what he's done for us over the past couple of years. And I think it was a moment where I kind of just went through a bit of self-reflection and I thought to myself, do you know what? There is so much more that I can offer and I can give. And I'm at a point in my career where it's still really exciting and I've got so much more to, to do here at International Studios. And I think for the, it's for the first time where I just kind of try to shrug it off a little bit and take more conviction and have more confidence in myself. 
And I think it was a turning point for me and the other people of colour within the studio. It's the first time that we really felt galvanised and empowered and had more licence. And that's not to say that we weren't given that or made to feel that way before, but we just had this unfortunate feeling inside that we just weren't worthy and we were frauds almost it's like you know you're here but do you really deserve to be here so I think if anything I'm, I'm just so pleased to see that people are feeling more open and willing to talk about things like that and it's something that I've really tried to enforce at international studios and just creating that safe space for people to come to work bring their true selves to work of course we have to be professional and to your point Yinka when you work for a US-based company there are US sensibilities and nuances that you have to understand and you're quite often trying to demonstrate what the international sensibilities are and what the UK sensibilities are but it was just a really good moment for us all to just pause and really think about what we have to offer who we are as professionals and what we're trying to do so it's not easy and I do not wish it on anybody to, to feel that way it's you can quite often get to quite a dark place but you know, as comms people, we have a lot to offer and a lot to give. And again, as Yinka said, we are trusted advisors and consultants for many. So really kind of take ownership of that and celebrate it, if anything. Thank you for sharing that. Um, I think it's reassuring for people to hear that even someone at your seniority still sometimes has those moments of doubt and that we all experience it. So thank you. Um, you also nodded to actually use a good segue to, to my next question that I wanted to direct to Jabba from um, one of our community, um, Tade Wanashi, who wanted to understand about the impact of the pandemic. And I think it would be great because you were like literally there next to Chris Whitty, Jabba, I can't imagine. Were you clicking the slides on the, the infamous? <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I, I wasn't. I wasn't yeah, we'd love wasn't, to know about that. What was it like? I guess, what was it like doing a real frontline comms job like that? Yeah. And also then your kind of experience of, of how the pandemic has affected comms and sort of changed that, the whole industry, really. Yeah, sure. Um, so what was it like? I mean, I sort of reflect on it now and it sort of seems really surreal that we were, uh, I mean, I was sort of involved in some very high level meetings and high level decisions that took place and some very, very high level announcements. You know, I, I remember the first, the very first Downing Street press conference uh, when they were still being held in person at number 10. Um, you know, I was being sat in the audience sort of like prepping Chris beforehand and being sat in the audience and like, uh, listening to the whole thing unfold. And then obviously we moved to sort of the, uh, the virtual press conferences and sort of doing all the work for that. Um, and it was a lot, right? It was a lot of work, it was very stressful, um, uh, you know, and I think we all sort of tried to do our best to try and stay on top of it. I think we were very conscious of how it was impacting the team and, and, and sort of our, our individual mental health. And, um, and you know, it's, it's sort of odd working on the, COVID story, but also sort of living through it at the same time, <clears throat> because, we, you know, there are people in our team who were worried about their loved ones or sort of, you know, were uh, new people who'd had COVID or sort of people who'd lost people as, as part of the pandemic. Uh, so all of this stuff was going on, but at the same time, we were just working at this incredible pace and incredible rate to try and deliver, uh, you know, like literally dozens and dozens and dozens of announcements. I think, you know, we had at the sort of peak of it, we were doing maybe like, you know, nine press releases a day or something, something crazy like that. Um, and it was really intense. Um, and it's really important to say, sorry, to Serene, to your point about Chris, and I, if you ever meet Chris Whitty, like you'll realize very quickly that Chris is a very, like very shy, reserved person, really very, very unassuming as, a, as, a, as an individual, but he has this incredibly big brain. And therefore, you know, when he, when he speaks, he speaks, so well and with such clarity that, um, that he's sort of automatically listened to, but he's not, not necessarily the loudest or the most vocal in, in the room. He's just the person who has the most to contribute. Um, so I think in a way that's sort of like, I think that, you know, to the question about imposter syndrome, like if, if you have a viewpoint, you know, be confident in that point of view and, and try and express it as much as you can and, you know, hope that the people there have the good sense to listen to you. Um, but I mean, just to sort of go back to the original question, like, I guess how it impacts has impacted the industry or sort of PR. I think from from my perspective, from the so I work in healthcare. I mean, I think the the public appetite, the media appetite for for healthcare news, for health stories, has increased like 
beyond sort of our ability to satisfy it really. Um, there's, people are so hungry for news, not just sort of COVID news, but any sort of news. I think one of the really big, the things that made a huge difference is the, the COVID vaccine. You know, like before the pandemic, a, a vaccine being developed and licensed and distributed within uh, a year or within sort of 10 months was considered impossible. You know, the, the fastest vaccine ever developed was done in about four years. But we, we managed to do it, you know, through the sort of partnership between government, industry and academia, we managed to do it in about 10 months. Um, and I think that has sort of really brought into very sharp focus the incredible power and innovation of science. Um, and that's made our job as PR people working on the, in these sorts of industries incredibly exciting, uh, but also incredibly busy. I know I don't know anyone who works in the in the healthcare space who's who saw their workload de decrease over the course of the pandemic. I think all of us sort of saw it go up yeah. but, and go, going up considerably. Um, so yeah, I mean it's it's a really exciting time to, to be in PR, to be in comms. I think you know the, the you know, like we were saying at the very start of this, I think uh, being in PR and being in comms generally is all about telling stories and, and stories are just as effective now as they've ever been. So, yeah. Great, thank you. It must have been a very incredible experience. Um, I'm, I'm conscious of time. And so I'm gonna switch over now. And we've had some brilliant questions submitted by um, the people watching tonight. So I'm just gonna go over and ask a few questions from the audience. And then I'll kind of come back and ask you a, a final finishing question in a minute. So um, really great question actually from Fuong, which is, how would you distinguish between PR and communications and or marketing? Which I think is quite quite an interesting one because as we all know, the uh, the lines are getting increasingly blurred. Um, Yinka, do you maybe want to talk to that a little bit? Yeah, marketing is usually paid for um, and, that, and, and whereas um, PR slash comms is something that you kind of, it's more kind of in the editorial space. Um, so I think that's the kind of, if you think editorial versus advertorial, um, obviously, you know, in every job that I've had, you work very closely because you're both in that kind of storytelling world. And so you're, you know, you're often working hand in glove and, and you know, and, and have shared aims um, and synergies, but, um, but, but, but they are quite distinct, I think. Um, you know, comms is, can be more kind of more reactive. Marketing is very much about planning. You know, often with, the, with marketing campaigns, you can kind of really, you know, plan them. You tend to work with an agency. Uh, you can do with comms as well, but it's, it, 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 it's a different kind of space. They're buying advertising, buying spot, buying, you know, all that kind of stuff. Um, doing that kind of creative as well. Um, so on the marketing side, they'll make a, put a campaign together. Um, and, and comms can help support that and help get help a marketing campaign to kind of, you know, go get gain legs and traction. Um, so that's where can, comms can sometimes support, but I think they, they are quite different. And it's funny because I've worked, you know, over the years, sometimes in roles where comms reports into marketing or <laughs> comms doesn't report into marketing. It's quite controversial in the comms yeah. world, actually. It's a very controversial, controversial, controversial subject because um, comms often wants to stand alone as its own entity and not be kind of, you know, submerged into marketing. Um, and so, yeah, I would say the majority of my time, it has, comms has been a standalone entity. Um, but yeah, I have experience working into marketing. Um, and yeah, you've just got to, I think in, every, in everything you've got to be flexible and kind of work with whatever the kind of parameters are, wherever you are. And I think that's kind of really key. Um, if I had a preference, I probably would, you know, kind of keep it in the kind of <laughs> comms as, you know. Obvious. You know, yeah, you know, that's what, you know, I think most people would probably say that. But, um, you know, it is what it is. You know, you, you work within the kind of parameters, really. Um, but yeah, I hope that helps answer that question. That's great. Thank you. Um, next question is about skills. Really interesting question from Osman, which is about what skills have you had to let go of as you've become more senior and what new skills have you had to pick up? Now, in the interest of time, because I want to get through some more questions, perhaps we can make this a quick fire. So maybe you can give me one skill you had to kind of let go of or delegate and one skill you've had to learn. So um, Shireen, do you want to take that one first? Gosh, 
it's hard because again to Yinka's point sometimes comms is so all-encompassing <laughs> there's so many different hats but just I'm pick gonna... one just pick one <laughs> okay I'll tell you one that I, I've had to let go which I let go on the agency side the the kind of having that digital and social media savvy I think again sometimes when you're working in comms and you're doing more corporate comms and, and strategy I couldn't tell you how to leverage TikTok in a successful way, but <laughs> I really couldn't. And that's why I really rely on those skills within my team, because I can sit there for hours and, and sit on TikTok, but I don't actually know, you know, I don't have the skills to then convert that into a successful campaign. Yeah. What new skill have you had to learn? <sighs> to be a mediator for <laughs> <laughs> Good answer. Gabba, come on, quick fire. What did you lose? Uh, did you I have completely lost the ability to manage my inbox and all <laughs> low level. <analysis. laughs> I cannot do it, guys. I can't at all. That's not that's not what I'm about. What I picked up instead, though, and this is what I tell myself, is that I'm much better at seeing the big picture. So I'm much more, I can sort of think of like, okay, broad brush, what are we trying to achieve? What's you know, what's the objective and how do we get there? But low-level stuff like managing an inbox cannot do it. <laughs> Yinka? I mean, I think it's all a building block. So you do kind of retain things. It's, you know, that, and that, I think that's kind of key. I, mean, I suppose the, I'll, the one that I'll say is a kind of temporary one, like letting go of, you know, in comms, you're supposed to kind of be out there and meeting people, making relationships. And I think the pandemic has made that quite tricky. And yeah. so you, it's a temporary kind of hiatus of you've had to kind of let go of being out there you know, having a coffee, you know, being just going to, you know, being external facing. And I, I don't like it. So <laughs> I won't be letting go of it permanently. Um, and then something that I've gained, I think I've just gained a better um, kind of handle on delegation. I think the higher up you go, you yeah. have to just be really kind of, um, you know, able to do, kind of do that. And you, because you, you, you just can't do everything. And that's for me. I think is was a, you know is something that I think um, you just you just you have to as you get higher up, up the ladder. Great, thank you. As all of you, I think, have said this evening, we're all still learning, aren't we? Um, really great question, actually, from Laura, which is how do you make contacts when you are at that entry level into the industry and you can't really offer anyone anything in in return? Like, how do you go about doing that? Because it is a really hard thing to do. I don't know who would like to take that. I think just going out and kind of like there are so many there's more than when I was starting out so many kind of um, bodies and groups and, and, and even things like this that you can kind of um, you know kind of be part of and I think it's just about really we, we've had a whole kind of tranche of new apprentices come into our company um, and I'm just what's really kind of stood out is how the, the, the confidence of just kind of come, you know lots of them kind of, kind of coming up to you and saying hi this is my name I've just started and, and, you know, obviously that's someone once they've got their foot in the door, but I think it applies whether you're in the door or not, yeah. is that having that kind of confidence. Um, and I think people are really kind of impressed by that and, and, and want to hear. So I just think it's just, you know, be, being a bit bold and, 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 and taking advantage of all the kind of opportunities that are out there, because there, there are a, a myriad of, thing, of, of kind of channels. Um, and just looking on company websites, you know, like on, on brands, because there'll be, there's so many of these kind of, apprenticeships, returnships, you know, I, I saw one of the questions about, you know, how, how do you get into the industry if you're more of a mature um, person? And returnships, I was even saying it to one of my friends, you know, she's a, a mother, has been out of the workforce for a while, and I said, you know that there's all these returnships that you can do? And then we just kind of Googled it the other night and just found loads of links of, you know, returnships. I sent them through to her, and, and so there are there is a wealth of stuff like that. You just need to know what the terminology is. Um, so go to somewhere like Creative Access, find out, you know, and, and really kind of tap those tap those resources up because there are avenues in. Be proactive. Look, like I said, look on those websites and, 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 and um, just don't give up. Yeah, no, that's great advice. And one build I would have to that is that I think that most senior people do want to give back to the industry and they want to help people in the way that they were helped. And I think there's very few people that if you emailed them and said, can you spare 10 minutes? And it's a good idea to frame it to say, I'm just not going to be a two hour meeting, but can you spare me 10 minutes? I don't think there's many people that would say no to that. So I agree with you. I think you should just go for it. Um, another question here, um, which I will give to you, Shireen, because you talked a lot about the importance of passion. 
um, again from Fuong, which is about how do you show that passion if you're at the really early stage when essentially you've just submitted a, a written application? How, what do you look for to kind of, as you're filtering through those applications and how can people stand out? I would say it's your perspective, your opinion on the world, you know, how you're perceiving change in certain industry, and then, you know, how you can kind of harness that into the role that you're going for. So for us in, um, in TV, I kind of move away from, tell me what you did at university, you know, tell me about your work experience. And I just say, what are you watching on TV? What do you think of Netflix and how Netflix has just completely changed the game of how we watch TV, even in the pandemic? The fact that we have been inundated with content and then hearing about people's thoughts and feelings on that and then harnessing, OK, so then how do you, you know, make sure a certain show stands out from the crowd? How would you position the show as the must watch and try and capture someone's attention when they've got 20,000 other TV series to watch? And I think if you have that interesting perspective or just a difference in perspective and thought, and then that underpinned by that passion, I think just sets you apart from other people. Yeah, that's great advice. Thank you. Um, there's a really interesting question from Temi. You all talked a lot about writing or you loving writing um, being a big passion. If you haven't done a degree that specifically was, you know, involved a lot of essay writing or writing, what advice would you give to um, help improve your writing? Are there any tips that you can give people? Jabba, maybe you want to, as an ex-journalist? Yeah, yeah, sure. Um, I should, it's very important for me to say <clears throat> I did not do an English degree. I didn't do a journalism degree. My degree was in medical science. Um, I decided in my maybe the final year or something like that that I wanted to sort of pursue a a career in journalism um, so I did a six-month postgrad diploma in newspaper journalism and then I got uh, a job in local papers um, now even that I don't think I needed really I, you don't need to be you know have a degree in English or have you know have loads of writing experience um, to make it in sort of in PR um, I think all you have to do is sort of learn well, have an interest in writing to begin with, um, but then learn how to do the basics and then practice and practice often. Write as many press releases as you can, you know, especially if you're, you know, starting out in your first role, volunteer to do, to do the press releases. Um, and, you know, get feedback from the people above you who may, who may know more about writing press releases, who may have, you know, they can sort of coach you and guide you. We used to do these copy clinics when I, was, when I started out as a, as a journalist. And, you know, like my copy used to be taken apart all the time, every single week. Um, and it was a bit brutal, but you know, it, it makes you a better writer because you're like, you know, the next time you won't do that, you'll write better. And then my my you know my editor to tell me, well, you know, just pick up a paper and look at how they write it in the paper and then ape, ape that as much as you can. And I think the same is true. You know, when I'm training people on how to write press releases now, I will say, you know, you need to go on, go on, you know, a few websites, go look at newspapers, look at how they write stories. And then try and emulate that as much as you can in the in the press releases that you're putting together. Um, and yeah, there'll be differences here and there, but you know, typically that's a fairly good way of improving your writing. Um, because you know, writing like everything else, it just takes time and practice. Um, and you know, after a while, you get good at it. That's great advice. Thank you. I'm having to relearn how to write press releases again, going back into my new, my new job. I'm going to take you up on that advice. Um, we've had so many questions submitted, which, which is brilliant. Unfortunately, we don't have time um, to answer them all um, this evening. So I'm just going to ask you all kind of one final question, and then I think we'll, we'll have to wrap things up. But it's brilliant to see the engagement. Thank you to everyone um, who's put up a question. So a kind of final quick fire question. What can you just give me one parting kind of piece of advice um, to everybody watching for getting into the industry? Just a kind of quick fire final thought. Yinka? For me, I would say it's breadth of skills. You know, try and have as many kind of strings to your bow as possible because that it will make, you know, really kind of stand you out. So whether it's having those kind of digital skills, you know, having the, you know, the, you know, obviously the writing skills is a basic, but that, you know, real breadth in your armory really will help to kind of stand you out. Great. That's great advice, Shireen. Be fearless. <laughs> you have to be fearless. You're going to get setbacks and knockbacks, but, you know, put yourself out there, get out there, 
there'll be emails that never get responded to letters that never get responded to but you will and you will find that role that is almost perfect and made for you and you just never look back so be fearless yeah imagine that you're thankful you're not Peppa Pig's publicist this week <laughs> <laughs> yes <laughs> Jabba final piece of advice um my advice I think would be try and no, you know, leverage your contacts, try and sort of use whatever means or tools. Creative access is a great one to try and get into, into the industry. Um, and more than anything, just, just be persistent, right? Like stick with it. I know that there'll probably be loads of like bumpy times, times when you're just like, I don't know, like not very happy in what you're doing, not, not fully, not very fulfilled in what you're doing. But I think as long as you stick with it and, you know, keep an eye for opportunities, you'll, you'll end up at a good place. That's great. Thank you very much. Um, there's a couple of uh, updates we just want to share with everyone about some activity we're doing at Creative Access. But while those slides come up, I just want to say a huge, huge thank you to our three panellists. We know how incredibly busy you all are. So we just can't thank you enough for giving up your time tonight and for all of that brilliant advice. Um, we, yeah, thank you very, very much. And um, yeah, we'll let you go and have a lovely evening. And a big thank you to everyone listening in and um, for asking questions. On that point that was raised earlier about um, some of the financial barriers at the start of your career, it's something we're incredibly conscious of at Creative Access. And we actually have live at the moment a career development bursary in partnership with McLaren Racing. Um, you can apply for this in order to get financial help um, towards your career progression. So anything from relocating to perhaps software um, that you might need. So if you go onto our website, you can find out further information um, and be able to apply for that. It closes on Wednesday, the 8th of December. So you still have a little bit of time to apply. So go to creativeaccess.org.uk. And then we are also at the moment, if you go into the next slide, we are also um, rerunning a survey that we did just at the start of the pandemic in 2020 to understand the impact of COVID on our community. Um, we know that people from underrepresented backgrounds are disproportionately impacted. Um, so again, we would love to get as many um, insights from our community as possible. So if you can support us and respond to that survey, that would be great as well. And you can access that through our social channels and also on our website. So we will let you go and enjoy the rest of your evening. Huge, huge thank you very much. It was a pleasure to meet you all. And um, yeah, bye everyone. Thank you. Thanks everyone. Bye. bye. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Bye.